Good morning. Uh, I still have uh, my cold, so I hope that my voice won't give up during uh, the sermon. So this is sermon on Matthew chapter 5, the text, uh, verse 21 to 37. My son is in grade four and he enjoys learning. Well, some would say with a mother who is a university professor and a father with two graduate degrees, it's not like he has much choice. No, seriously, he really enjoys learning. And at school, he's been progressively introduced to team projects and group presentation. And through this, is learning an essential fact that will remain true for the rest of his life, meaning that in every group, there's always someone trying to do the strict minimum. May it be at school, at work, or in our churches, we can always find individuals who are satisfied to follow the minimum requirements, who refuse to do something because it was not explicitly mentioned or justify their actions by saying that is not forbidden by the law. For example, Jesus asked us to show the other cheek, but after we have done it, there's nothing else said, many claim. So everything is fair game. What? The strict minimum. And very honestly, there was a small part of me that wish that I wish this week that I belonged to a group and had someone else to write this reflection on today's text from the gospel according to Matthew. Because you see, after the beatitude that bless the disenfranchise of our societies. After the affirmation that we are all the light of the world, this portion of the Sermon on the Mount addresses difficult topics like anger, adultery, divorce. And since they're not necessarily the most popular subject in our churches these days, especially two days after Valentine's Day, I understand that many of my colleagues do not want to touch this challenging passage with a 10-foot pole. So instead of trying to answer everything in this long and complex text, let us focus on one section, the beginning of it. Jesus said, I have heard that it was... You have heard, sorry, you have heard that it was said to those in ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I said to you, if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to counsel. Well, you shall not kill one another. I would say that this statement fall into the category of plain old common sense. Humanity would not survive long if we constantly murder other people. We may even wonder why it need to be mentioned in the Bible. It, it feels like when we go to buy a coffee and on the lead, we can read caution, uh, content art. Well, I hope it's art. I order a coffee, you know, that feeling. However, we all know this word ought to be there because some people, for some reason, do not get it. So in the same spirit, the Ten Commandments had to include, you shall not kill put it there specifically, and it had become a pillar of the Jewish faith since the time of Moses. And I'm sure as soon as this word has been read, there are some who look at them and said to themselves, well, I kill no one today, 
I'm good. I have done what God asked me to do. Once again, the strict minimum. So Jesus decides to bring a little twist in this instruction that everyone in the crowd already knew. But let's be clear here. It does not say that the Jewish laws are bad and need to be fixed. It does not claim that his mission is to bring new commandments that would replace the old ones. It's not condemning Judaism or trying to start a new religion. Jesus was a good Jew who followed the law and upheld the words of the prophets. Now, his issue is the temptation of some to adopt a literal interpretation of scripture. His speech, to, his speech is an attempt uh, to put some meat around the bone, I would say. He wants to explain to everyone that the laws of older times are not ending points that settle it for all and forever, but only the beginning of wisdom and faith. But I said to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, You'll be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council, said Jesus. If some analyst affirmed that this is an intensification of the law, like don't kill, don't even be angry, I rather believe the matter here is not our emotions but an invitation to establish right relationship with one another. You see, in our society, we love to affirm that everyone is important. All lives are important. All lives are sacred. And yet, when we nurse anger, call someone uh, good for nothing, feed resentment toward others, it starts to eat us from inside, and this feeling often leads to frustration, dislike, confrontation, and progressively our relationships are affected by this. We begin to draw a distinction between the people we love, the good ones, and the people we hate, the bad ones. And we continue in the cycle. We lose respect for one another. The lives of those people are, becomes a little less valuable than the one we love, the member of our family, our community, our nation. The life of those dying over there in enemies, enemy countries become insignificant. And eventually, we end up forgetting that they are as we are, all part of God's creation. Jesus does not call us to deny our emotion. It, it would be unhealthy. We are rather invited to be aware of their powers and to understand how they can hurt ourselves and others. When we embrace hate and, and anger, we often fall for the desire for uh, revenge, retaliation, getting even. We start rumors. We gossip. We utter words that hurt, and we slowly and progressively can enter in this cycle of abuses and aggressions that can go as far as bullying, racism, discrimination based on origin, gender, sexual orientation. We convince ourselves that they are the source of our problem. If only, only if those feelings are solely inside ourselves. We, have, we believe that we're not the one to blame for what's going on. They are the one, those people, creating all the problems of our society. So knowing all of this, Jesus provokes us by suggesting that the opposite of murder 
is not just avoiding killing, but valuing the lives of all. What is the opposite of anger? It's not just being nice, but actively looking for reconciliation. As human beings, we will always disagree with one another on one topic or, or another. That's part of our human nature. But instead of letting it grow to the point of bitterness and confrontation, we are invited to deal with this conflict directly, responsibly, immediately. We are asked to be humble and acknowledge our responsibility. We are called to reach out for some sort of higher righteousness. That aim would be to improve the way we live in our community. We are encouraged to engage with our fellow human beings, to seek their gifts, to affirm their worth, to restore those who have been written off. Instead of aiding one another, we can practice reconciliation in our relationships. Everyone who cooks regularly knows that the ultimate goal is not to make sure that we follow step-by-step, line-by-line a recipe. The ultimate goal is to prepare something, cook a meal, bake a cake that people will enjoy. That's, that's the point, yeah? Well, as Christians, we're not asked to worship the words in our Bible, to follow literally without thinking the laws and the commandments we receive, nor to try to find a way to be saved by doing the strict minimum. Now, we are called to believe in the values in the words of Jesus and to let God's love permeate our whole being and influence our dealing with one another. Our challenge is to accept that another world is possible and this world can begin with us and what's going on, going on inside ourselves, our aim should always be to live in authentic and life-giving relationship with those surrounding us. Thanks be to God, and amen.